So not too long ago, I made a video about barefoot style shoes and how to transition into barefoot shoes and some of the problems that arise when we do that. And that video did really well and I had lots of different comments and questions. So in this video, I'm actually going to go through all of the shoes that I wear on a regular basis. There's not one magical shoe that is the best hiking shoe ever that will work for everyone in every situation. Depending on the terrain, how your foot is structured, how your hips work, do you have a high arch, low arch, wide foot, skinny foot, there's lots of different factors to consider. So in this video, I just wanna give you a really broad view of the kind of footwear I use to be able to make some recommendations to you. If you're looking to transfer some of your hiking and some of your daily life into wearing a barefoot shoe. So where could you start wearing a more minimal style shoe? I think the best place to do that is not on the trail. It's best to be you know, barefoot at home and wearing more minimal style shoes like around the city and walking in parks and that kind of thing before you even start thinking about transitioning to doing any kind of barefoot hiking. But where I think a good place to start is actually with a fairly supportive shoe, just one that's a little bit wider. And the shoe that I have right here, the Merrill Long Sky 2, is a really good starting point for this. So this is a wider based shoe and it has a lot of support. A lot of the Merrill shoes, even the Vibram Barefoot Style Merrill shoes like the Trail Glove, I think it's called, has actually got some arch support. So for someone that has quite a lazy arch and then they need a little bit of support under the arch that's probably a, uh, a good place to aim to later on down the track but for someone who's just starting out this is a, a really good supportive shoe and it's also really light and very capable on the trail we've got a decent amount of tread there vibram rubber and vibram rubber is kind of like the gold standard of traction and endurance people really love vibram rubber so this is not quite a trail running shoe and not quite a hiking boot it does have plenty of stack height and support it's nice and wide at the bottom and for that reason i think it's a really good place to start a couple of nice little features on it it's got the gator trap at the back so if you're uh, into using gators there's a little velcro trap there and a hook on the front my only complaint about it is that it is still not wide enough i mean the my toes are really squished at the front of this shoe so whilst it is a good starting point I don't think it's a shoe that is going to really allow your toes to spread out and it's certainly not going to be comfortable if you're wearing toe spreaders which is one of the things that I do recommend if you've got toes that have been you know squished together over 10 or 15 years of wearing very narrow shoes then you should be wearing toe spaces and this isn't really going to allow for that. So another good starting point would be the Hoka One One, pretty much any one of those shoes. They have a huge stack height, they have lots of cushion but they're also really wide so for anyone that has bunions and squished toes and that needs to wear toe spaces or any sort of insert for their toes there's loads of room in those. So where can we go from here if we wanted to take things a little more minimal where well, the obvious answer is ultras. I have a little bit of experience with ultras I used the Ultra Olympus 4 on an 800 kilometer through hike that was a good shoe it's the same story with ultras though all the time. They do fall apart really quickly, but I'll probably still keep buying ultras because I think they're really great shoes. Uh, this is the one that I've been using at the moment. It's the Ultra Superior 5. I used this in Germany when I did, you know, kind of eight days hiking and most of my summer hiking this year has been done either in the Ultra or one of the Viva Barefoot shoes that I'll talk about later. So the Superior 5, just like every ultra shoe is that they're super wide i mean have a look at that that is actually how a, sh a shoe that is actually how a foot is supposed to be shaped when we allow those toes to spread out and you know this is still not a barefoot style shoe really because we have you know quite a decent stack height there's a lot of cushion here uh, this one actually came with an optional rock plate which i didn't choose to use on my uh, last hiking adventure but if you are concerned about being a little bit too sensitive underfoot with rocks and roots and things, then Ultra have that option, I think in most of their shoes now, where you can either buy the rock plate separately or it comes with the shoes, which in this case, for me, it did with the Superior 5. But as you know, if you've worn Ultras, you'll burn through these super quickly. They aren't cheap as well. I think I paid like 140 euros for these. 
and uh, they very rarely go on sale. So if you're looking for a shoe that is quite barefoot, quite minimal, that's going to last longer than this, then I have something for you. This is the Magna Forest ESC from Vivo Barefoot. I've used this all throughout the winter. The interesting thing about this barefoot style hiking shoe is that it really combines that sweet spot where you have much more durability because it's made from one big piece of leather or maybe a couple of big pieces of leather. This one, as you can see, has got a fair bit of wear and tear and that's because I wore it all through the spring and the winter. I wore it in really snowy conditions. If you go back to one of my videos during winter, you'll see me wearing this on a ski trip where I took my ski boots off and I was wearing these stomping through the snow. These are absolutely waterproof, as waterproof as any other, you know, Italian style mountaineering hiking boot up to, you know, this level, of course. And at the same time, it's a completely barefoot style shoe. Yes, there's a little bit more underfoot. Uh, you can see the tread there that it's made from the Michelin rubber. So Michelin rubber is relatively new to the footwear world as far as I know. I've had a couple of Vivos now that have had that Michelin rubber and it's actually really, really good. The lugs are huge, you know, they're really wide. The grip is amazing. And at the same time, they're still very light. I haven't run in these, but my friend Max has these and he said he runs in them all the time. And funnily enough, he says that they don't get really warm. Now, I was always a little bit skeptical of that and I certainly haven't used it in summer because I'm just kind of terrified of having a really warm, sweaty foot. Something about, you know, leather and summer doesn't really sit with me. Perhaps I should try it out. So the structure of the shoe is really minimal. It's obviously zero drop, very flexible, very bendy, twists in every way like a barefoot shoe should. It's very wide, plenty of room for the toe box, all of those things, it ticks the boxes, right? The weird thing is it has this base of leather with just this upper, which is essentially like a sock, like it's a very kind of stretchy, kind of like a glove for your shoe that wraps around your ankle. And your question there might be, oh, well, what about ankle support? Well, personally, I think ankle support is absolute nonsense. Like it's a complete joke. I would need a lot longer video to explain that properly. But essentially, I believe that the ankle should be able to support itself. And realistically, if you think about it, even if you had, you know, a boot like this, I think this is the Forest ESC, that has ankle support and it has, you know, leather all the way up past that tuberosity, that big bone that sticks out of the ankle, a little bit of leather isn't going to stop you from breaking or straining an ankle. If you've got your entire body weight plus momentum coming down into a position which the ankle can't handle, a little bit of leather is just really not going to stop that in my opinion. I think if you want to protect the ankles, you should build strong ankles. And if you want to build strong ankles, check out my mountain proof ankles routine which is free and you can download the PDF, the link is in the description. Okay, moving on. So, so I've talked about the Magna, we started getting into this boot, which is the Forest ESC, and this looks a lot more like an actual hiking boot. Obviously, the differences are that, again, it is completely malleable, twistable, flexible, which enables your foot to work naturally and Michelin rubber on the bottom again, so a really nice sole. Again, this is made out of a couple of big pieces of leather and they are very warm and very waterproof. This is what I would consider to be, a, you know, a winter spring boot. I have used it in wet, snowy conditions and it is waterproof, as waterproof as you would expect any other leather hiking shoe to be. I have treated all of these leather barefoot style hiking shoes with a little bit of beeswax that my friend Mike sent me from Backpacking NL. It's called Tikani Outdoor Beeswax. So if you're in Europe and if you want to try some beeswax out for protecting your shoes and waterproofing them, then that's, a, that's something you can check out. So the ESC Forest, as you can see, I haven't used this one a lot. Certainly not as much as I've used the Magna. The reason why is just because I find them a bit too heavy. I don't like they're ultra high ankle. I've never really liked that in hiking boots, but video barefoot do continue to just send me boots after I made that video. They absolutely loved it and they just keep sending me shoes, which they're welcome to. Uh, one of the newer ones they've sent me is the Magna FG Men's. I haven't even worn this one, as you can see. 
So this is just like a nicer looking <laughs> version of the one that I've um, kind of trashed. Well, not trashed, it's still, still going really well. The main difference is uh, this one has the Michelin rubber and this one has the kind of standard, I'm not sure what they call it, but it's the standard kind of Vivo trail sole. So let's take a look at this. You can see what, what it's like when they're actually new. So we have that wool kind of stretchy sock at the top, which really sort of cinches around your ankle. There's the leather mid upper and the sole. Something that's new that they've added to this model is the thermal insole from Outlast. So apparently 300% more thermal protection with only three millimeters of rubber underneath the foot. So that's fairly impressive, but I've never had a problem using this version. As I said, I was using it all winter and my feet were never cold. They were as warm as my ski boots. So there we've gone through the true kind of barefoot style hiking shoe, something that is, you know, high ankle, protective, leather, all of the rest of it. What if you want to go super minimal, something super light that's very thin, but you still want a little bit of grip underneath? Well, that's the shoe that I pretty much wear on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the Primus Trail Firm Ground. So the difference between this and the regular Primus, which is the shoe that I showed in the barefoot video, is that this one has, you know, a proper trail sole with a decent amount of lugs. Now, this is a shoe that I've been wearing for a trail running shoe, for an everyday shoe, for, you know, we're walking around the city, this is my training shoe. I have a tendency to just like absolutely fall in love with a shoe and just smash it <laughs> and wear it all the time, whether it's hiking, walking, being in the city, training, and that's what's happened with this shoe. I have pretty much constantly worn this shoe for around about two months and I absolutely love it. For me, this is a huge upgrade to the regular Primus. I like having that uh, thicker sole purely just because it's going to last longer. I mean, my old Primuses, they're basically like slick because I also fell in love with those and I wore them <laughs> like nonstop. And this thicker sole with the bigger lugs on the bottom makes it actually a hiking shoe. You know, I did do a little bit of hiking in the old Primus, the one that I showed in that video but nothing serious, you know, it was just like short day hikes and that kind of thing. This shoe, I'm more than comfortable in doing a multi-day hike in, probably up to about carrying a 10 or 15 kilo pack. If I was carrying any more than that, I would probably opt for the Ultra just because it's got a little bit more cushion underneath. So I've given you there kind of a, a starter kit of working from, a, you know, a very supportive shoe all the way through to a very minimal shoe. The thing is though, every single trail requires a different shoe. Every experience, every adventure has its own unique demands. And so certainly if you're in Tasmania or Alaska and the, you know, really wild places, perhaps you would need something a little bit more supportive than this. Perhaps you would need a more traditional shoe. And certainly if you're in snow, winter conditions, if you're you know, cutting steps into the snow, if you're hoping to adapt crampons to a shoe, then certainly you would need something a little bit more rigid with that really hard edge. But outside of that, I see very few situations where you actually need to have that support. Like I mentioned before with the ankle support, I really don't think there's any substance behind the argument that you need ankle support. Maybe it's something I'll get into another video. But the main reason I wanna share all this information and give you another option from just wearing the traditional style shoe or boot is that we're living in an area of foot dysfunction where it's the norm to have foot pain, knee pain, ankle pain. And you might not have any of those symptoms yet, but if you're sitting eight hours plus a day and if you're wearing a very supportive shoe that desensitizes your foot and doesn't allow your foot to create its own arch and spread the toes naturally and bend and flex like it should, then quite frankly, it's only a matter of time until you do start experiencing some sort of pain in the hip, knee, ankle or foot. That sounds very alarmist, but it is the sad truth that we're all experiencing. 85% of people will experience hip, knee or ankle pain or foot pain at some stage during their life. It's extremely common. It's almost a certainty if you're sitting a lot and if you're wearing supportive shoes. Now that I mention it, I'm going to change. I'm going to change the way I'm sitting just so 
I'm practicing what I preach. The thing is you can go for decades without feeling any pain in your feet because the feet are very robust. And if you look at it from an evolutionary biology perspective, that makes a lot of sense because if you're the caveman and you have foot pain and you can't walk, then caveman is gonna get left behind from the tribe. Unfortunately, he's gonna die alone. <laughs> so because the feet are so important to our evolutionary livelihood, they have evolved to put up with a lot of discomfort and a lot of beating. So when foot pain occurs, you might be led to believe that this latest pair of shoes that you're wearing or this new exercise regime that you started is responsible for that foot pain. But the reality is most of the time that that foot pain is simply a result of accumulation of tightness in the hips from sitting eight plus hours a day and wearing overly supportive shoes. And not only now are you getting those pain signals from the body and from the foot in particular saying, this is going to be a huge problem if you don't start fixing it. So I've kind of highlighted there or called out the two main culprits of foot dysfunction, overly supportive shoes and our tendency to sit in chairs in one set position for a very long period of time. Without giving some varying stimulus to the hips and changing the position of the hips as we sit throughout the day. Chairs allow us to be very comfortable. They allow you to sit in one position without moving rather than shifting your body weight around internally and externally rotating the hips and sitting in different ways. So my advice to you, if you wanna go down this path of wearing more minimal style shoes, is to not just look at the shoes in isolation, but also think about your body as one system that interacts with its environment constantly. You know, it's constantly getting signals and if the signals that you're putting in is that you're sitting at a desk or in a couch or in a car eight hours a day then your body will adapt to that our bodies are adaption machines whatever stimulus we give or don't give the body the body will adapt to that and generally the way that it adapts is in efficiency in tightening muscles and restricting joints and that results in pain and I think for most people, what they want to get out of going down this barefoot path is not only you know, feeling lighter and freer and more capable in their body, but also experiencing a lot less pain and discomfort in everyday life, which at the end of the day is going to enable us to keep moving, to keep hiking well into old age. And as you know, that is a common theme on this channel to keep you guys going for as long as possible to be happy and healthy. If you've made it this far, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to my rant. And I hope that you've found that uh, this information has been useful. If you are on this path of learning and discovering your own body, and if you have something to share with our community, then put it in the comments section. If you like the video, then like the video. And that's about it for this one. I'll see you on the summit.